Hi, you guys. Welcome to Audrey's Reading Area, the fun and exciting Audrey Reads to You show. <laughs> I just made that up, but it's true, though. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, being here, showing support, and listening to me read fun and exciting books. And in this case, I'm doing some black. Through my eyes. Through my eyes. Ruby Bridges, by the way, she's still alive. Ruby Bridges still lives. She is 67 years old, and she still lives. Through my eyes, Ruby Bridges. It's a scholastic book. And um, first, I'm going to ask you to click that like button. Click that share button. Go on over to YouTube and smash that subscribe button. Alexa, what time is Audrey's reading area? Audrey reads in her area live at 5 o'clock p.m. <laughs> well, all right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right, you guys. Through my eyes, Ruby Bridges. So, <clears throat> this is the picture of Ruby Bridges. Beautiful young lady. It says, Harry Belafonte. There's a note from Hall Harry Belafonte. I'll read that afterwards. There's a preface to her story. She's born in the Deep South. She has a new home. And where do I start reading this? Hmm. Okay, we'll start with Born in the Deep South. <clears throat> Born in the Deep South, I came into this world as a healthy seven pound baby, my parents' first child on September 8th, 1954. From the small hospital in Tylertown, Mississippi, where I was born, my mother took me home to the farm where my parents lived with my father's family. My father's parents were sharecroppers who worked the land under the broiling Mississippi Sun. Sharecroppers didn't own the land they farmed. They paid the rent to the landowners and whatever crops they raised and struggled to survive on what was left. So that's a little bit about her background. This is uh, them picking cotton. This is a closer picture. They're picking cotton. I'm going to jump around because this is a long book. A new home. My family moved to the old seaport city of New Orleans in 1958 when I was four when I was four <clears throat> on the block where I lived everyone was black white families lived on the next block but at the time it seemed as if they were a world apart a lot of black people like my parents had left farms in Louisiana or Mississippi to make a better living in the city in New Orleans we rented the front part of a large house on France Street. It was a big roaming house with other families living in apartments upstairs and in the back. Our part of the house had only two bedrooms. So my younger brothers and my sister and I shared a room. In 1960, when I started first grade, there were four Bridges children. But eventually there were eight of us piling into bunk beds in that bunk room. Oh wow, in that uh, bedroom. The best part of the house was the kitchen where we ate all of our meals. My mother did a lot of cooking. We had big Southern breakfasts with grits, bacon and eggs and homemade biscuits. Okay, it says my parents didn't have much education and it took everything they had to keep the family going. My father worked as a service station attendant. My mother sometimes took night jobs like cleaning rooms in one, one of the city's hotels. She wrote, I remember my mother taking a job making caskets. She would tell stories about how she and the other workers would get into the caskets to see if they were comfortable and how they would take naps in the casket during their breaks. My brother and sister and I thought these stories were fascinating. My mother brought, brought us up to believe that God is always there to protect us. She taught us there is a power we can pray to anytime, any place. At that, at the same time, my mother didn't allow any nonsense from her children. 
she was strict. We all had chores and were expected to carry them out. When she told us to do something, we were supposed to say, yes, ma'am, and not too much else about it. Because, yes, ma'am, and you did it. The good old back in the days, right? So when it was time for me to start kindergarten, I went to the Johnson Lockett Elementary School. My segregated school was fairly far from my home, from my house, but I had lots of company for the long walk. All the kids on my block went to Johnson Lockett. I loved school that year, and my teacher, Mrs. King, was warm and encouraging. She was black, as all the teachers in black schools were, black, were back then. Mrs. King was quite old. And she remembered uh, me, she reminded me of my grandma. What I didn't know in kindergarten was that a federal court in New Orleans was about to force two white public schools to admit black students. The plan was to integ integrate only the first grade for that year. Then every year after that, the incoming first grade would also be integrated. In the late spring of my year at Johnson Lockett, the school the city school board began testing black kindergartners. They wanted to find out which children should be sent to the white schools. I took the test. Ruby Bridges. I was only five, and I'm sure I didn't have any idea, any idea why I was taking it. Still, I remember that day. I remember getting dressed up and riding uptown on the bus with my mother and sitting in an enormous room in the school board building along with about a hundred other black kids, all waiting to be tested. Apparently the test was difficult and I've been told that it was set up so the, that kids would have a hard time passing. If all the black children had failed, the white school board might have had a way to keep the, the school segregated for a while longer. But that summer, my parents were contacted by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. That's the NAACP. The NAACP is an old and well-respected civil rights organization. Its members work to get equal rights for black people. Picture, picture, yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm skipping around in this book because it's very long. So several people from the NAACP came to the house in the summer, told the parents she was just a few of the black children to pass the school board test and that she had to be chosen to attend one of the white school. Wow, she had been chosen. Wow. So they said it was a better school and closer to my home than the one I'd been attending. They said I had the right to go to the closest school in my district. They pressured my parents and made a lot of promises. They said, my going to William France would help me, my brothers, my sister, and other black children in the future. We would receive a better education, you know, and all that stuff. Parents argued about what to do. My father, Abon, didn't want any part of, in, of school integration. He was a gentleman and feared that angry segregationists might hurt his family. Having fought in the Korean War, he experienced segregation on the battlefield where he risked his life for his country. He didn't think that things would ever change. He didn't think I would ever be treated as an equal. Lucille, my mother, was convinced that no harm would come to us. She thought that the opportunity for me to get, to, get the best education, was, uh, best education possible was worth the risk. And she finally convinced my father. Wow. So Lucille Bridges wrote some notes at the bottom. I'm going to read a note. Ruby was special. I wanted her to have a good education so she could get a good job when she grew up. But Ruby's father thought his child shouldn't go where she wasn't wanted. There were things I didn't understand. I didn't know Ruby would be the only black child in the school. I didn't know how bad things would get. I remember being afraid on the first day Ruby went to the, to the front school. When I came home and turned on the TV set and I realized that at that moment, the whole world was watching my baby and talking about her. At that moment, I was most afraid. That was a note from Ruby Bridges' mama. 
my mother breaks the news. When September came that year, I didn't start first grade at William France. The lawmakers in the state capital, Baton Rouge, had found a way to slow down integ 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 integration. integration. So I was sent back to my old school. I didn't know I was ever supposed to go to school anywhere else. So being black at Johnson Lockett was fine with me. All through the summer and early fall, the state legislators fought the federal court. They passed 28 new anti-integration laws. They even tried to take over the public school system. The Louisiana governor, Jimmy H. Davis, supported the segregationists. He said that he would go to jail before he would allow black children in white schools. Wow. He even threatened to close all of the public schools rather than see them integrated. The federal court led by federal district court judge J. Skelly Wright, unyielding in his commitment to uphold the law of the land and in his dedication to equal opportunity for all Americans would block the segregationists again and again. J. Skelly Wright struck down the state's new anti-integration laws as un unconstitutional. School in integration would proceed. Praise the Lord. Woo, woo. The judge couldn't enforce his order in time for the start of school in September, but he set a new deadline for Monday, November 14. The anger all across New Orleans convinced Judge Wright that things might grow violent. He asked the U.S. government to rush federal marshals to New Orleans to protect the black first grader. There were four of us in all. There was a fifth girl originally, but her parents decided at the last minute not to transfer her. Three of the remaining children, all girls, were to go to a school named McDonough. I was the fourth child. I was going to integ integrate William Franz Public School, and I was going alone. Wow. On Sunday, November 13, my mother told me I would start at a new school the next day. She hinted there could be something unusual about it, but she didn't explain. There might be a lot of people outside the school, she said, but you don't need to be afraid. I'll be with you. All I remember thinking that night was that I wouldn't be going to school with my friends anymore, and I wasn't happy about that. So November 14, 1960, November 14, 1960, my mother took special care getting me ready for school. When somebody knocked on my door that morning, my mother expected to see people from the NAACP. Instead, she saw four serious looking white men dressed in suits and wearing armbands. They were US federal marshals. They had come to drive us to school and stay with us all day. I learned later they were carrying guns. I remember climbing onto the back seat of the marshal's car with my mother, but I don't remember feeling frightened. William Franz Public School was only five blocks away so one of the marshals in the front seat told my mother right away what we should do when we got there. <clears throat> wow. Let's get out of the car first, the marshal said. Then you'll get out and the four of us will surround you and your daughter. We'll walk up to the door together. Just walk straight ahead and don't look back. Wow. When we were near the school, my mother said, Ruby, I want you to behave yourself today and do what the marshals say. We drove down North Galvez Street to the point where it crosses Alvar. I remember looking out of the car as we pulled up to the front school. There were barricades and people shouting and policemen everywhere. I thought maybe it was Mardi Gras, the carnival that takes place in New Orleans every year. Mardi Gras was always noisy. As we walked through the crowd, I didn't see any faces. I guess that's because I wasn't very tall and I was surrounded by the marshals. People yelled and threw things. I could, I could see the school building and it looked bigger and nicer than my old school. When we climbed the high steps to the front door, there were policemen in uniforms at the top. The policemen at the door and the crowd behind us made me think this was an important place. I must be... It, it must be college, I thought to myself. 
Wow. This is a picture of across the street from the school. Police kept an eye on angry demonstrators across the street from the school. Wow, you guys. That's so deep. So deep. <clears throat> So deep. Once we were inside the building, the marshals walked up a flight of stairs. The school office was at the top. My mother and I went in and were told to sit in the principal's office. The marshals sat outside. There were windows in the room where we waited. That meant everybody passing by could see us. I remember noticing everyone was white. All day long, white parents rushed into the office they were upset. They were arguing and pointing at us. They took their children to school that morning. The parents hadn't been sure whether William Franz would be integrated that day or not. After my mother and I arrived, they ran into classrooms and dragged their children out of the school. From behind the windows in the office, all I saw was confusion. I told myself that this must be the way it is in a big school. That whole first day, my mother and I just sat and waited. We didn't talk to anybody. I remember watching a big round clock on the wall. When it was three o'clock and time to go home, I was glad. I had thought my new school would be hard, but the first day was easy. Hmm. This is them leaving that school that first day. And this is her, let me see if I can get this right here. Ruby Bridges, William Franz Public School in New Orleans. When we left school that first day, the crowd outside was even bigger and louder than it had been in the morning. There were reporters and film cameras and people everywhere. Wow. I guess the police couldn't keep them behind the barricades. It seemed to take us a long time to get to the marshal's car. Later on, I learned there had been protesters in front of the two integrated schools the whole day. They wanted to be sure white parents would boycott the school and not let their children attend. Groups of high school boys joining the protesters paraded up and down the street and sang new verses to old hymns. Their favorite was Battle Hymn of the Republic in which they, they changed the chorus to glory, glory, segregation, the South will rise again. Many of the boys carried signs and said awful things. But most of all, I remember seeing a black doll in a coffin, which frightened me more than anything else. After the first day, I was glad to get home. I wanted to change my clothes and go outside to find my friends. My mother wasn't too worried about me because the police had set up barricade, barricades at each end of the block. Only local residents were allowed on our street. That afternoon, wow, I taught a friend the chant I had heard, two, four, six, eight, we don't want to integrate. My friend and I didn't know what the words meant, but we would jump rope to it every day after school. Wow. My father heard about the trouble at school. That night when he came home from work, he said I was his brave little Ruby. Protesters. Wow. <clears throat> Ruby's first grade teacher, Barbara Henry. Uh, there's a note from her in here. I'm going to read it real quick. It says, leaving the school day, the school each day seemed even more frightening than arriving in the morning. I always drove to work and kept my car on the playground behind the school building. The police had turned the playground into a parking lot because it was the only area they could protect. On leaving school in the afternoon, even with a police escort, you were always fearful of how the people gathered along the sidewalks might choose to pro protest that day as you drove past them. Wow. The New Orleans police were supposed to be there to help us, but they very much dislike being the ones to enforce integration. So you never could be confident of their support and cooperation. Wow. So even the police that was there, that was supposed to be there to protect, 
they were still a little like, oh, I don't know. They're going to help me out because they didn't want the integration either. On the second day, wow. My mother and I drove to school with the marshals. The crowd outside the building was ready. Racists spat too at us. Wow. And shouted things like, go home, nigger, go home. And no niggers allowed here. One woman screamed at me. I'm going to poison you. I'll find a way. She made the same threat every morning. I tried not to pay attention. When we finally got into the building, my new teacher was there to meet us. Her name was Mrs. Henry. She was young and white. I had not spent time with a white person before, so I was uneasy at first. Mrs. Henry led us upstairs to the second floor. As we went up, we hardly saw anyone else in the building. The white students were not coming to class. The halls were so quiet. I could hear the noise the marshal's shoes made on the shiny hardwood floors. Mrs. Henry took us into a classroom and said, have a seat. When I looked around, the room was empty. There were rows of desks, but no children. I thought that we were too early, but Mrs. Henry said we were right on time. My mother sat down at the back of the room. I took a seat up front and Mrs. Henry began to teach. I spent the whole first day with Mrs. Henry in the classroom. I wasn't allowed to have lunch in the cafeteria or go outside for recess, so we just stayed in our room. The marshals sat outside. If I had to go to the bathroom, the marshals walked me down the hall. My mother sat in the classroom that day, but not the next. When the marshals came to the house on Wednesday morning, my mother said, Ruby, I can't go to school with you today, but don't be afraid. The marshals would take care of you. Be good now and don't cry. I started to cry anyway, but before I knew it, I was off to school by myself. Wow. By myself. Wow, wow, wow. Being taught in the school by herself. Wow. This is um this is an an artist uh painted or drew this. Um the artist Norman Rockwell was inspired by paragraphs in Travels with Charlie to paint a picture called The Problem We All Live With. It was published in the January 14, 1964 issue of um Look Magazine. This is the uh the painting. You see that word up here? Very bad word. Yeah. This is a uh, Ruby. That's Ruby. So it says the author John Stenback was driving through New Orleans with his dog, Charlie, when he heard about the racist crowds that gathered outside the front school each morning to protest its integration. He decided to go see what was happening. He especially wanted to see a group of women who came to scream at me and at the few white children who crossed the picket lines and went to school. At the time, I didn't know that there were other children in the building. We were kept apart. The women were known as the cheerleaders and their foul language even shocked a man as wordly as Steinbeck. I never met John Steinbeck, but he seemed to sympathize with what I was going through. He wrote about me in a book called Travels with Charlie. Steinbeck left his dog and his truck in a parking lot. He didn't want to take them to France where his dog could get hurt or his car could get damaged. Instead, he took a cab. Fearing that protesters would wreck his car, um, the driver didn't take Steinbeck all the way to the school, but left him a few blocks away. Steinbeck never knew my name. My name and the names of the girls at the McDonough school were never mentioned on television or in the newspaper. The press tried to protect us. That was a good idea. This is Steinbeck right here. Picture of Steinbeck right here. At the start of integration, many white parents were afraid of the protesters in front of the front school. Even if the parents believed in integration, they didn't want to put their children in danger by sending them to class. 
However, a few families took the risk. As a Methodist minister, Reverend Lloyd Foreman was convinced that integration was morally and spiritually right and was determined to keep his daughter Pam in the front school. That November, the minister walked Pam to and from school every day. Very quickly, the chorus of racists became obsessed with the foremans. They taunted them without mercy. Wow. Wow. And you guys feel free to freeze or pause the video. And you can pause the video and let me bend it so you can see it. Pause the video and you can read what's at the bottom. Okay, pause it and read it. This got deep. A woman threatening to strangle the Reverend Foreman with her scarf. That is just deep. That's deep. <clears throat> so we have the Gabrielles were another brave family. Daisy and her husband, Jim, had several children, including a six-year-old named Yolanda. Mrs. G uh, Gabrielle had been in the army during World War II, and she refused to be bullied by the protesters. When I entered William Franz, da Daisy Gabrielle did not take Yolanda out of school. I don't remember ever seeing Yolanda, even though she was a first grader. The school building was large and any white children who attempted who attended were kept far away from my classroom. They were assigned separate teachers and were hurried in and out of school through a back entrance. Yolanda Gabrielle came to school every day for three weeks. During that time, her family's home was attacked. Wow. Stones and rotten eggs were thrown. Windows were broken. Hecklers gathered in front of the house and threatened to hurt the Gabrielle children. Daisy's husband was about to lose his job. Though the police set up protection for the family and a wonderful New Orleans woman named Betty Wisdom offered to drive Yolanda to school each day, Daisy Gabrielle knew her daughter was still at risk. Still at risk. Wow. In the end, the Gabrielles gave up. They not only took Yolanda out of school, but also moved the family to another state, a northern state where Daisy's husband had grown up. It was time to get away from Louisiana. Wow. Here's a picture. Here's a picture. You can also freeze and read this. Wow. Times were really, really kind of hard back then, right? Really bad. Three little girls at McDonough. While I was attending William France, uh, France, a couple of miles away, three black girls were integrated, uh, integrating McDonough number 19. Their names were Leona, Tessie, and Gail. picture on that page. Wow. They had riots. They had the Ku Klux Klan. Trouble was always breaking out all over the place. This is the, 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 the acts of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, burning. This is them with their little hats and masks on hiding their face. And this is them just burning crosses who boy they had it hard back then the first week of school integration the tension um in the first week of school integration the tension in new orleans seemed to to build each day rioters on the streets were looking for trouble whites assaulted blacks in broad daylight and blacks fought back even though the NAACP urged them not to, vandals broke store windows and took what they could. To curb the crowds that gathered, extra police on horseback and motorcycles were brought in. When Mayor De Lesseps S. Morrison appeared on television and called for calm, militant segregationists were enraged. They got mad. 
They felt the mayor had betrayed them. When the mayor asked them to be peaceful and calm, they felt betrayed and they got mad. Finally, the protests began to die down. By the end of the week, the worst of the street riots were over. Thanksgiving was coming and the public schools were closing for a week long holiday. City school superintendent James F. Redman made it clear that school integration would continue after Thanksgiving. However, resentful white parents promised not to give up. They would protest again as soon as the schools reopened. The New Orleans School Board appealed to the federal court for a temporary halt to integration. The board said it needed time to settle certain legal questions. Thurgood Marshall, the NAACP lawyer who commented on the appeal, would eventually become a justice of the U.S. State Supreme Court. Mm. Mm. See that picture there? That's Thurgood Marshall, the lawyer for the NAACP. Look at that. I'm trying to smooth out so you can see. Nice. Mm. Oh, I like this picture. I'm going to show it to you in a second. Everybody was glad for time out at Thanksgiving, including me. So remember, this book is through my eyes, Ruby Bridges. So Ruby Bridges wrote this book. So when I say I, uh, it's Ruby Bridges talking, not me, but Ruby Bridges. Okay, so everybody was glad for that time out at Thanksgiving, including me, Ruby Bridges. Beautiful child. Even so, the stress didn't go away completely. The owners of the small grocery store at the end of the block suddenly told my family to stay away. Because we were a part of school integration, the white owners no longer wanted our business. My grandparents telephoned from Mississippi to say they were afraid for us. They thought my father would be lynched, murdered by a lawless mob. My parents didn't tell us if they were afraid for their lives, but I knew my father was worried about how to make a living. The garage where he worked had fired him because I was going to a white school. Wow. Financial help was on its way, fortunately, and it came through the U.S. mail. People from around the country sent gifts and money. They knew what was happening in New Orleans because of television news programs, as well as magazines and newspaper articles. Many Americans wanted to encourage us. The money made a big difference to my family and it kept coming for months. Wow. Along with the money came presents for me. There were toys, books, and clothes for school. The packages were addressed to me. So I thought they, they should be mine. My mother didn't agree. She would say, Ruby, you have to share these things with your brothers and sisters. They can't all be for you. When one child in a family is receiving a lot of attention, it can cause problems. The gifts were wonderful, but they sometimes meant a tug of war. I thought my mother was being mean when she told me that I had to give some of my presents away. We received stacks of encouraging cards and letters. Even Eleanor Roosevelt wrote me a note. She was the widow of Franklin Roosevelt, the former president of the United States. Mrs. Roosevelt's note was my mother's favorite, and she looked at it again and again. Eventually, letters came from around the world. We kept a lot of them, but they didn't survive. In 1965, a hu huge hurricane, hurricane named Betsy flooded parts of New Orleans. Mrs. Roosevelt's letter was lost in the flood. Oh no. Along with the Purple Heart my father received for bravery in the Korean War. Those were sad losses. Mrs. Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt. Wow. She's gonna she always she will always remember how, how the neighbors on Front Street helped us through the winter. They came by all the time to see how we were doing. They were nervous about the racial tension in the city, but they also wanted to support us. At night they watched the house to make sure no one was was prowling around. That's cool. After the Thanksgiving break, neighbors would babysit or help get me dressed for school in the morning. They would also watch for the marshal's car to, to arrive. Once I was in it, men from the neighborhood would walk behind the car, looking for signs of trouble as the car slowly left the safety of the block. One of our neighbors who ran his own house painting business offered my father a job. 
My father didn't, didn't hesitate. He was grateful. On the spot, he began a new line of work. In December, the crowd that gathered in front of the school was smaller than before. The people who came were angry, loud, militants, but the numbers were down. On December 5th, attendance at William Fronts was at 18, though, though at the time, I did not know that other children were in the school. See the picture? This is the picture. So, this is the picture on the other side. Yes, yes, yes. That it was John F. Kennedy. He won the election in November and we come, would become president on January 20th. So this is a segregationist throwing an egg at a car carrying some of the white children who attended William Franz in December. Throwing an egg at the car. Wow. They were still fighting school integration. After Christmas, my teacher and I settled into a routine. It was odd to be the only one in class, but I finally decided this was the way it was going to be here at front school. Being Mrs. Henry's only student wasn't a chore. It was fun and felt sort of special. She was more like my best friend than just an ordinary teacher. She was a loving person and I knew she cared about me. Mrs. Henry and I always had fun. We did everything together, reading and word puzzles, spelling and math. We sang songs and played games. Since I couldn't go outside, we pushed decks out of the way and did jumping jack, desks out of the way and did jumping jack exercises. Once or twice, Mrs. Henry got permission for us to walk in the schoolyard, but it was strange to be out there with no other kids around. Look at her, look at the pictures. Their pictures. I remember seeing men standing off in the corners of the yard. I thought they were hiding from somebody. Later, I learned that they were plain clothes detectives. I spent so much time with Mrs. Henry and liked her so much that I began to speak the way she spoke. I learned later that Mrs. Henry was a northerner from Boston, Massachusetts, and she did not have a southern drawl. I didn't like, I, I, I didn't sound like my brothers and sisters but I didn't know why. I now know that Mrs. Henry influenced me a great deal that year. She had a polite, kind manner that I admired. In fact, I began to imitate her. Little by little, I grew to love Mrs. Henry. We became very attached to each other. Aw, this is her teacher, Barbara Henry. Aw, this is Ruby. Wow. Ruby was a smart, sensitive person. It was a joy to, so this, I don't know who wrote this. It doesn't say at the bottom. Um, oh, it's Barbara Henry wrote this, her teacher. So I'll read that at the end. In the meantime, let's look at these pictures. Ruby walking through the door. Look how little she was, how young she was. All these grown people just attacking and attacking. Wow. Look at her. Brave, brave, brave. Wow. Mm -mm -mm. The, it says the child psychiatrist Robert Coles came into my life that winter. At the time, he was a young man in the Air Force station right outside of New Orleans. On his way to a medical conference one morning, he came up the mob. He came upon the mob outside my school and noticed me being led into the building by the marshals. At that point, he became interested in me and wondered how I could go through such an ordeal. Soon after, he went to the NAACP to offer his help. Dr. Coles felt that it would be easier for me to enjoy this, endure the stress if I had someone to talk to outside of my family. Dr. Coles met regularly with me. He also met with the three girls from McDonough, number 19, and with the white children from each integrated school. Every week, Dr. Coles would come to my house with his tape recorder. He would ask how I was doing. 
and I mostly told him I was doing fine. Then he would pull out crayons and would ask me to draw pictures of myself or the school or some of the people in my life. Afterward, we would talk about how the pictures showed what I was feeling, even if I couldn't put it into words. I think those pictures helped him to understand me. I enjoyed the time I spent with Dr. Coles because an important man was coming to visit me and color with me and that made me feel special. His wife was a caring person and often came to the house with him. She would always bring something special for me when she came. My mother taught Mrs. Coles how to cook gumbo and they began, became good friends. Wow. Dr. Coles le, uh, later wrote about me in a number of books and articles, along with stories of other children of crisis. He seemed to admire how well I held up through the front school experience, but he, all, he was always curious about what kept me going. Now, this is a picture of the child psychi psychiatrist, Robert Coles. This is a picture of him. Robert Coles. Wow. This is an interesting story hearing it from Ruby Ruby Bridges' eyes from her perspective, from her point of view. Pretty interesting. There were times that went that winter when I did show stress, nightmares would come and I would get up and go wake my mother for comfort. My mother would raise herself up in bed. Did you say your prayers before you, you, you went to sleep? She would ask. If I hadn't, mama would say, honey, that's why you're having a bad dream. Go back now and say your prayers. I would do as she said, and then I would sleep. Somehow it always worked. Kneeling at the side of my bed and talking to the Lord made everything okay. My mother and our pastor always said, you have to pray for your enemies and people who do you wrong. And that's what I did. Another problem that year was lunchtime at school. I often ate in the classroom by myself while Mrs. Henry took her lunch break with the other teachers. It was a lonely time. The marshal sat outside while I opened up my lunch box. As time went on, I couldn't eat. First, I blamed it on the fact that my mother fixed too many peanut butter sandwiches. Then I began to wish and wish that I could go to the cafeteria with the other children. I could smell the food they were eating. I was convinced that the kids were there. I began hiding my uneaten sandwiches on a storage cabinet on, in the classroom. I poured my carton of milk into the big jar of paste we had in the room. <laughs> in my magical way of thinking, not eating lunch would somehow get me to the cafeteria. When roaches and mice began to appear in the room, uh-oh, a janitor discovered my old sandwiches. Mrs. Henry wasn't mad at me. She was just sorry there were so many days when I hadn't eaten. After that, she usually ate with me so I wouldn't be lonely. Oh, At home, there was a period of time when I had trouble eating too. All I wanted were potato chips and sodas. My parents told Dr. Coles about it and he tried to talk with me. Then he remembered the woman in the crowd outside school each morning who said she was going to poison me. Dr. Coles thought I was afraid the woman would really, really would do it. I'm not sure if I was afraid of that or not. Perhaps I was just a picky eater, but in any case, once the year was over, my appetite returned. There were certain treats that winter and spring that helped me feel better. One AACP member, a woman named Mrs. Smith, was particularly good to me. She was the wife of the pediatrician I saw that year. I believe that Dr. Smith was donating his services to make sure I stayed healthy. Mrs. Smith spent time with me to keep my spirits up. On the weekends, Mrs. Smith would pick me up in her car, car and I would go from one world into another. I went to a zoo for the very first time and visited Storyland at City Park here in New Orleans. Mrs. Smith also took me to her house. Compared to my family, the Smiths were wealthy and I was amazed when I saw their color television and the piano that her son gave me lessons on. The whole family was very kind to me. 
Those were wonderful weekends, but they left me a little dizzy and unsure about who I was and where I belonged. But now it's clear to me that those visits showed me a better side of life and made me feel that I had to do better for myself. Ruby. Ruby. That's Ruby. Near the end of the year, Mrs. Henry and I finally had company. A few white children began coming back to school, and I got an opportunity to visit with them once or twice. Even though these children were white, I still knew nothing about racism or integration. I had picked up bits and pieces over the months from being around adults and hearing them talk, but nothing was clear to me. The light dawned one day when a little white boy refused to play with me. I can't play with you, the boy said. My mama said not to because you're a nigger. At that moment, it all made sense to me. I finally realized that everything had happened because I was black. I remember feeling a little stunned. It was all about the color of my skin. I wasn't angry at the boy because I understood. His mother had told him not to play with me and he was obeying her. I would have done the same thing if my mama said not to do something, I didn't do it. The next thing I knew, it was June. That incredible year was over. Oddly enough, it ended quietly. I don't remember any special goodbyes as I headed off for summer vacation. I was sorry to leave Mrs. Henry, but I somehow thought she would be my teacher again <laughs> in the fall and forever. Mrs. Henry gave me an excellent, gave me excellent grades at the end of the year, but I was told that the school principal threatened to change them. She and I had received so much individual attention that the grades weren't accurate. Mrs. Henry was angry and quarreled with the principal. Mrs. Henry was sad for me and very upset that the principal could be so mean to me. I don't know to this day whether the grades were changed or not, but it didn't matter. The principal couldn't change what was in my head. Wow. This is her and some friends. Wow. Sometime in the spring, this is what Barbara Henry, her teacher, wrote. Sometime in the spring, I found out three or four other first graders had been coming to the school for a while. I was stunned when I found out. It seemed cruel to keep Ruby by herself for so long. I went to the principal and told her I wanted Ruby and the other first graders to be together. By law, you have to integrate the school, I said. Integration means putting black and white children in the same classroom. As I see it, you are breaking the law by keeping them separate. The principal wouldn't budge, but I suggested we call the superintendent of the school to talk about it. The principal finally gave in. However, she would not force the, the other first grade teacher to include Ruby in her class. Instead, the white children came into my classroom for part of each day. It was progress, progress right? That's her and her friends again, and Ruby. Ruby, Ruby, Ruby. She began second grade. No marshals drove her to school. They disappeared. Um, this is what it says. She lost a teacher and her best friend. Hmm. So the teacher wrote another note. At the end of the year, it was very hard to let go of Ruby. Even so, I wasn't sorry to leave New Orleans. Integration had been a shattering experience. After New Orleans, Boston seemed like a very appealing, uncomplicated place. I have trouble with the word proud. I am pleased that Ruby and I made it through the year. A goal had been set out for Ruby and we reached it. For years, I thought about Ruby. I had one teeny photo of her with her front teeth missing and I guarded it my whole life. The pictures were in the top right hand drawer of my uh, bu 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 bureau. And I would check every once in a while to make sure Ruby was still there. She was like an invisible part of my family. Over the years, I told my children about her again and again. I had to keep the memory alive. 
After I left New Orleans, I knew the school was not a place where I was welcome. The principal had made it clear my association with that school was complete. I was never extended an invitation to return, but I used to, I used to wonder how Ruby was doing. Wow. Another picture. That's what the teacher wrote. She says her second grade teacher seemed mean to me and she didn't seem to like me very much. She even made fun of my Boston accent when I read aloud in class. I know you had that Northern woman for a teacher last year, she would tell me, but you're not saying the words right. For months, I tried to pronounce words the way the other kids did, but I never again sounded like anyone else in the class. For from second grade on, I felt different from the other kids in my class, and it wasn't just because of my accent. William Front's school was integrated, but the long, strange journey had changed me forever. Wow. And uh, I'm going to read you one last thing in here. It's about it, it's uh, from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. There is no easy way to create a world where men and women can live together, where each has its own job and house, and where all children receive as much education as their minds can absorb. But if such a world is created in our lifetime, it will be done in the United States by Negroes and white people of good will. I will be accomplished uh, it will be accomplished by persons who have the courage to put an end to suffering by willingly suffering themselves rather than in, inflict suffering upon others. It will be done by rejecting the racism, materialism, and violence that has characterized Western civilization and especially by working toward a world of brotherhood, cooperation, and peace. Martin Luther King Jr. Hmm. The end. The end. Um, it says, let me bring you up to date. Actually, there is. Oh, wow. There are some pictures of her and um, some more. This is her when she graduated high school beautiful when she graduated high school i'm about to show you another one receiving an honorary degree at the college of new rochelle when she graduated college nice okay i'm gonna read let me bring you up to date it's a couple of pages long oh she was reunited with her teacher mrs henry There you go with her teacher. There we go. The light came on. So, wow. I am, I am just, oh, like just thrilled that I had this book to read to you guys. It's thrilled. It's a, I, I it's from her perspective. And I, there was a lot of things that you know because i've heard about ruby ruby bridges in the past but i didn't hear from her perspective like in this book things that happened in her own eyes she didn't know people were really angry at her she didn't know it was because she was black she didn't know it was because of the color of her skin maybe you'd like to know what has happened to me since i helped integrate the front school i finished william france and went on to graduate from an integrated high school i have lived in new orleans ever since when I was in seventh grade, my parents separated. I think the pressure my family was under in 1960 caused serious problems in the marriage. My parents had never really agreed about my going to William France and it put a wedge between them. Money problems and other family problems continue too, which couldn't have helped. After my parents separated, my mother moved us children out of our house on France, France Street and into a housing project. Over the next few years, my mother had a rough time financially. My father stayed in the old house and I missed him so. 
He died of a heart attack when I was 24. I wasn't a child anymore, but losing my father was terrible. How did I get through 1960 in the long year of integration? I think it was a combination of things. For one, I really believed as a child that praying could get me through anything. I still believe that. Also because of my mother's strict discipline, which was the way many children were raised then, I knew I was expected to obey. Getting through first grade was partly just a matter of obeying my parents. As the eldest, as, as the oldest child, I was also used to being responsible and looking out for my brothers and sisters. The responsibility that was placed on my shoulders in the first grade may have felt familiar to me, even if it was heavy. Still, I sometimes feel I lost something that year. I feel as if I lost my childhood. It seems that I have always had to deal with some adult issues. After graduating from high school, I remember wanting to go to college. I regret not having that experience. My mother thought doors would automatically open for me as a result of what ha I had accomplished in 1960, but there was no one around to help lead me, th lead me through those doors as I was led through the doors of William Franz. After high school, I had the opportunity to study travel and, and tourism. And I later became a travel agent, one of the first African-Americans to work for American Express in New Orleans. For 15 years, I thoroughly enjoyed working as a travel agent. It allowed me the opportunity to see parts of the world I had only dreamed about. Eventually, <clears throat> I met and married a wonderful man named Malcolm Hall. And we now have four sons. We've struggled financially, but the Lord has made a way for me and my family. We have also been able to send our sons to integrated schools in a city that is less racist than it used to be. In my adult years, I began to feel that my life should have a greater purpose. In the early 1990s, my youngest brother Milton was killed in a drug related shooting in the housing project where he still lived. I was very shaken. Oh, wow, by this, as was the rest of my family. However, my brother's death woke me up in a way. It made me take a long look at my life. I slowly began to realize that what I had done in 1960 was meaningful and important. It allowed me an opportunity to speak to people and to help kids who were in trouble the way Milton had been in trouble. Little by little, my life took on a new meaning. It's odd how misfortune can bring on new blessings. One of the changes I made after my brother's death was to go back to the front school to do volunteer work as a parent liaison. My brother's young children were students there and I wanted to help them recover from their father's death. The school is in a poor neighborhood in the inner city and most of the students there now the, well, most of the students there now are African-American. Wow, I'm going to skip a little bit. Says the kids are being segregated all over again. There aren't enough good resources available to them. And why is that? Hmm. So, so he, she says, nowadays I travel a lot all across the country. I always feel nervous about public appearances, but I do book signings and school visits. In school, I empathize the importance of reading. Reading. Audrey's reading area, reading. It's important to read. I believe strongly in literacy and the power of education. Sometimes I also talk to kids about race. When I'm addressing young students, I read the story of Ruby Bridges. Older students whom I uh, talk to have often seen the Ruby Bridges story the Disney television movie that was based upon experiences. With older kids, I start a discussion about the movie or the book and then get kids talking about racial problems in their own lives. When the scary subject of race is finally uh, broached, kids want to talk and talk. It's very satisfying. When the story of Ruby Bridges was published in 1995, I became visible again to the public. And amazing things began to happen. After the book came out, one of the people who discovered it was discovered it was Barbara Henry. Barbara Henry, her teacher. 
For many years, my first grade teacher and I were lost to each other. When she saw the book, she was able to contact me through the publisher. Wow, that's amazing. Being reunited with Mrs. Henry, as I am still tempted to call her at times, was one of the great joys of my life. We first saw each other again on a special episode of the Oprah Winfrey Show in 1996. I think I'm going to look that up and watch it. We hadn't seen each other for 35 years. Now we not only stay in touch, but we sometimes do book signings together as well. I have been in contact with Robert Coles again too. He had been out of touch with me for 30 years. During that time, he published a good deal in, and often wrote about me, but I wasn't very aware of it. It was as though Dr. Coles was keeping my story alive until I could grow up enough to tell it myself. To be honest, I feel as if my life grew away from me for a long time. I wa it wasn't until I was 18 that I even found out that the artist Norman Rockwell had made me a subject in a painting. As a grown woman, I watched the public television series Eyes on the Prize about the civil rights movement. And my mother had to, my mother had to point out the sum of the old film footage was of me. Wow, imagine that. It's taken me a long time to own the early parts of my life. I don't know where events will go from here, but I feel carried along by some bigger, something bigger than I am. For a long time, I was tempted to feel bitter about the school integration experience, not understanding why I had to go through it and go through it alone. Now I know it was meant to be that way. People are touched by the story of the black child who was so alone. Interest in the story keeps growing and I'm not the one making it happen. The picture book and the Disney movie project, project seem to fall out of the sky. Boom. I have reached two honorary college degrees. She's received two honorary college degrees in recent years. I have been featured in newspaper articles and made television appearances, and I've become a public speaker, a job I would never have dreamed of doing. In all of this, I feel my part is just to trust in the Lord and step out of the way. For many years, I wasn't ready to be who I am today, but I've always tried not to lose my faith. Now I feel I'm being led by just that, faith. And now I'm closer to being at peace with myself than I ever have been. For further information about my work and foundation, write to the following. The Ruby Bridges Foundation, P.O. Box 6, Rockville Center, New York, 11571-0006. And I will put it up here for you to see and pause. There it is. There it is. I know now, as she said, I now know that experience comes to us for a purpose. And if we follow the guidance of that spirit within us, we will probably find that the purpose is a good one. And that was written by Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges. This is her signing some books for children. Wow. This is a powerful book, you guys. Ruby Bridges. There's one more picture. One more picture. The end. Wow. I hope you guys stuck around me, stuck around and listened to me read on this Educational Tuesday. Educational Tuesday. I hope you guys stuck around and listened to this book. Um, through my eyes, Ruby Bridges, she wrote this book. Yes, Ruby Bridges. I enjoyed reading it and I hope you guys enjoyed hearing it. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here and listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, this is, again, this is Black History Month and I am celebrating it with you by reading books like this. So go ahead and look at the pictures on this page, the back of this book. Glad you enjoyed, shout out to my mom. Her name is Bev. She's always here listening. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Patsy. 
Patsy, Patsy, my cousin Patsy, thanks for being here. You and the Williams Bunch. That's the way they became the Williams Bunch. <laughs> the Williams Bunch, Destiny, Dollar, Delilah, Deanna, DJ. Got it. All right, you guys. Shout out to Ellie. Shout out to Sheena G. Shout out to Victoria for sharing my book. Shout out to Sylvia for always being here too. Now, if you're on here, shout out to you. I just can't see you unless you make a comment. Shout out to all of you that are here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. And I will see you tomorrow, right? Live, L-I-V-E. Live at five tomorrow. I will see you soon. Here at Audrey's Reading Area. Oh yeah, don't forget to go to YouTube. Smash that subscribe button on Audrey's reading area, Audrey's reading area, Audrey's reading area. And I will see you soon.